can go ahead and start the recording there. Everything looks to be in check. All right, so we got recordings on, microphone is on. Hopefully you guys can see the screen still. Um, yeah, and we'll go from here. So I think I, I wanted to do a recap from chapter one at first, and I'll edit this later, but yeah, I, kind of, I might've just forgotten to add this, I think. Like I said, I've been working on this all day, so I apologize if there's like spelling mistakes, I'll go back and fix those before I like upload and stuff. But basically, these are some things that the, um, you know, week two stuff is gonna cover, right, from the reading and everything. So we're gonna go over quantitative relationships between temperature and the average internal energy or average kinetic energy of a molecule. Um, and then we're gonna go over how energy is transferred, specifically regarding like the first law of thermodynamics, and then PV work, which is pressure volume work, right? So a relationship between temperature and pressure is kind of the first bulk or chunk of this information right here, right? So first of all, right, the um, kind of the example that they used in the readings and how they probably used it in class as well is that they're asking you to look at like ideal gases for any of these examples and especially for the PV work stuff when you're compressing and expanding stuff it's usually a gas that you're doing that to um, and so big question is how can we model behavior of a gas right so each gas will move freely and bounce everywhere in a container right that's how like, ideal gases will behave they'll collide with each other they'll collide with the side of the container and that's how everything kind of goes so um, with each gas particle you can have both position and velocity, right? So that, those are ways that we can model behavior of a gas. You can describe its position, you can describe its velocity, position in the x, y, or z direction, right? So x and y, you obviously know those, right? x direction, y direction, and there's also the z axis, right? Which is like into and out of the page, basically. Now, um, velocity is the same as well, x, y, z velocity, you're traveling to the right, left, up, down, into and out of the page. Right, so um, there's a lot of information per particle to keep track of, right? There's a lot of information per particle to keep track of. So we wanna look at some kind of value that will sum up X, Y, and Z position, X, Y, and Z velocity um, to describe average particle behavior, right? Because if you grab every single molecule in a gas, like say, let's say you have a mole of nitrogen, right? That's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules it is gonna take forever to describe the velocity and position of every single molecule. That's six pieces of information right there. Multiply that by six, roughly six times 10 to the 23rd molecules. That's 36 times 10 to the 23rd pieces of information to describe a mole of gas, right? That's insane. So we wanna look at those concepts or values that can describe average particle behavior. And those values or concepts are going to be temperature and pressure. Those are the values or the concepts that we're gonna to use to describe average particle behavior. So. If you remember from 131, right, we talked a lot about pressure. Pressure is force over area, which is in units of newtons per meter squared or pascals, which is more often in this course, right? Uh, you, can, you can see other values like millimeters or mercury atmospheres as well, but mostly it's gonna be pascals, right? Um, how do gases exert pressure? So gases will exert pressure by hitting the side of a container, exerting a force over a specific area, right? So if they hit the side of a container, right, and they hit that container at a specific area, take that force divided by that area, and then that's how we can calculate the pressure that a gas will exert. And then the sum of all the forces that the gases exert divided by the area will give you the overall pressure, right, of the, of the container. Because you take every single particle, whatever force it exerts divided by the area that they're exerting the force on, sum that all up, and you get the pressure. It's kind of conceptual. You don't have to like really fully, fully like know all of this stuff, but just know the general concept. Now, what is temperature, right? So temperature is the average kinetic energy of a group of molecules, right? So temperature, average kinetic energy. Average kinetic energy is temperature. This is super, super important. So some molecules, right, will have greater kinetic energy than others just on an individual basis, right? So some molecules might have a lot more kinetic energy than other molecules, but on average, on average, if we were to describe the overall gas, if we had 10 moles of nitrogen, we would describe the whole thing instead of taking every single individual particle, right? On average, all of those molecules would ha will have an average kinetic energy that is described by temperature. What do I mean described by temperature? Well, we're gonna get to that here in a bit with some background information and, and derivations about this stuff. But if you remember from uh, 131, remember the average kinetic energy is half mv squared and if you're really good and you remember that's also equal to three halves kvt 
Now this is the relationship that I'm going to derive here in a sec, like how we can get to that um, roughly, right? But the idea here is that your temperature is related to your average kinetic energy, right? So that's probably the most important concept to get out of these uh, um, slides here, right? So temperature is essentially the average kinetic energy. On average, all molecules have an average kinetic energy that is described by temperature. Well, we've talked about temperature, we've talked about pressure, how the hell do they relate, right? So what's what's the idea here? What's so important about temperature and pressure and how can we relate them to, to, together, right? So to be clear, there are some long as hell derivations in the readings to get the relationship that we see below. Um, you can reference them if you're interested. They're in the readings. It's like three or four pages, like I said, alone just to get to this one equation, which then we also use to get to some other equations later on. But P is pressure, V is volume, N is the number of molecules or particles, and K in the little brackets there is average kinetic energy. So you might be wondering, well, I still don't see temperature, right? We'll get to that here in a second. But basically, this is one of the equations here that you can see here, right? So you can see that pressure and volume are related to the average kinetic energy here and to the number of molecules that you'll have um, in a container, right? So part two is that we see that from Gen Chem, we know that PV equals nRT, where little n right here is the number of moles. R is the ideal gas constant and T is temperature, right? If you remember that, that's the ideal gas law from Gen Chem. If we were to re rearrange or redefine PV equals nRT, then what we see is this n for moles, this little n for moles here, right? We can rewrite that as the number of molecules divided by Avogadro's number, right? So let's say you have like six molecules times, you have Avogadro's number here, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules and that's one mole, right? This is molecules at the bottom. So molecules will cancel out with molecules and you're left with moles, right? So that's that's how they get that N divided by Na over there. So your moles is equal to N, your number of molecules, divided by Avogadro's number times RT, right? Well, here's another tidbit. R divided by Na, right? R divided by Na just so happens to also be equal to Boltzmann's constant. You remember that from 131 as well? Now, Boltzmann's constant was that 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin, right? So it just so happens that when we rewrite N, the number of moles, as the number of molecules divided by Avogadro's number, we get R divided by Na, right? R divided by Na. And that just so happens to be equal to Boltzmann's constant. So we can actually rewrite it again. PV is equal to NKBT. So R divided by Na that will become KB and you're left with NKBT. So we're kind of we're kind of getting there. Remember we were talking about how kinetic energy is equal to 3 halves KBT if you remember that from 131. We're kind of getting there. We had the KBT, right? We're just kind of there's some derivations and some things that we need to do to kind of get there. But the idea here is that if we relate the last equation from part 2 right here that PV equals NKBT and we relate the first equation that we got from part 1 that PV is equal to N two thirds K, right? Where this is the average kinetic energy. If we relate these two equations together, basically you see here, this is PV, this is PV. If you set these two terms equal to each other, you'll see that two thirds K is equal to KBT. And then if you just multiply the three over and then divide over the two, you get three halves KBT is equal to your average kinetic energy, right? So this is where we're getting that relationship between pressure um, temperature, and then kinetic energy as well. And that's why I'm saying kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy is more or less going to be your temperature, right? We say it's related to the temperature, but temperature is basically an indication of your average kinetic energy. Why? Because there's literally no other variable on the right here. You have three, two, those are constants. KB is a constant. Temperature is the only thing that can change here. So whenever, whenever we're looking at temperature, any change in temperature, really temperature is going to be the only variable that's going to factor into your average kinetic energy. And so that's why we often say temperature is just a measure or a description of your average kinetic energy, right? Now, once again, the little brackets mean average, right? So this is the average kinetic energy per molecule, right? So on average, if we were to look at any one molecule on average, and we were to want to look at its average kinetic energy or its internal energy, right? Then that would be equal to 3 halves kBT right? So on average, each molecule will have a kinetic energy value related to 3 halves KBT. This equation only gives us the average internal energy, 
right? This is only the average internal energy, not the total internal energy, right? It's the average kinetic energy or the average internal energy per molecule. So on average, each molecule will have a kinetic energy value related to 3 halves kBT. But this is not the total internal energy. It is not the total kinetic energy, right? It's just the average. 3 halves kBT is just the average. This is kind of what I said earlier as well. Did someone have a question? My bad. Yep, so I'll get to that here in a second. It's the number of molecules that you multiply it by. But yeah, excellent. Um, so this is kind of going back to what I said earlier. So why do we say it's average kinetic energy is equal to the internal energy, or the average internal energy, I should say. Um, for an ideal gas, you assume that there are no inter intermolecular forces. So there shouldn't be any potential energy of any kind. Remember, so internal energy, just think about the overall energy of a, of a system, right? So if you remember from the work and energy chapter in 131, we said like that work is equal to the change in energy and that's equal to the change in kinetic plus change in potential. And we had all that, you know, stuff to do, right? Now, do we see a change in potential in an ideal gas? No, because potential energy would have to like for that form of potential energy to occur here in that case, it has to come from bonds, right? And for gases, they really don't form bonds necessarily, unless obviously it's a, you know, diatomic gas, but for an ideal gas system, there are no intermolecular forces, um, so no bonds or anything like that. And so in that case, there shouldn't be any potential energy of any kind, right? And then um, the overall internal energy in that case, right, so our change in energy would just be equal to the movement energy or the kinetic energy of the molecule. So that's why we say that the average kinetic energy is also equal to the average internal energy for an ideal gas system at least. And yes, this will be recorded. Mm -hmm. um, but like Gabe was saying earlier, like what if we wanted to find out the total internal energy instead of the average, right? What if we wanted to find out the, the total instead of the average? Well, think about what average means just in a general sense. If I added up a bunch of numbers and divided by how many numbers there are, that gives me an average. So one plus two plus three, right? That gives me six. Six divided by three, three being how many numbers I added gives me an average of two, right? So average is equal to the total sum divided by the number of things that I summed. Using that logic, right, I know that the equation for my average internal energy or my average kinetic energy, right, I know that equation, that's 3 halves kBT. If I just multiply that equation by the number of things that I summed up, the number of molecules, right, that I summed up, then that's how I can get the total sum or my total internal energy. So if I just take that 3 halves kBT, the average kinetic energy, the average internal energy, multiply it by the number of molecules that there are, I should be able to get the total internal energy change for the entire gas system, right? Um, but that's kind of basically the most one of the most important things that you should kind of know for um, relationship between pressure, temperature, and um, kinetic energy. But yeah. Um, there are example problems. I don't know. I, I want to make sure that I have enough time to get through everything. So I'll probably like go over these at the end or something, but just know that like the worked out answers in detail will be found in the, um, 132 reading. If you want to go back and look at those for sure. But I just don't want to spend like too much time like doing these practices, like, especially like these aren't, aren't the bulk. They're not the, you know, meat and potatoes of everything that we're doing for, for week two. Um, cause the PV work stuff, like how to calculate the work from a graph is is more intense. So I want to make sure I have enough time for that. Same thing for, for example problem two here. Um, the only thing, well, actually, you know what? I will go over example problem two since I already have it kind of worked out here because I, I made sure to work this one out specifically because it, I thought it was probably one of the more important problems in the reading. So let me go over that one real quick. So it says two containers are holding different kinds of gases placed in contact with each other and they come to thermal equilibrium but they do not mix, right? So we have two containers, they have different gases, they're in thermal contact with each other to the point that they're reaching a thermal equilibrium, all right? Now the question is, are the temperatures of the gases the same? Are their internal energies the same? And are the average speeds of the molecules the same? So let's start off with temperature first, right? Is the temperature The same or not?
They got one yes. Anybody else want to chime in? So thermal equilibrium, yes, that means that at this point there's no net heat flow, right? But they do have the same temperature actually, right? So they're in complete thermal equilibrium. They should have the same temperature. They should have the same average kinetic energy, right? So that's... No, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's 100% correct. Because if you look at even chemical equilibrium, just species reacting with each other, right? Um, in a chemical equilibrium, you will have the forward and, and reverse reaction rates equal to each other, right? And you'll still kind of have, you know, a reaction kind of going maybe either one, one way or another, right? But overall, it's kind of a net zero type of motion here. So yes, there's no like net heat flow, right? Maybe in one second or another, you might have more of one substance than the other or higher temperature here over, you know, in, in one, you know, object over the other. But roughly, for the most part, on average, right, in that equilibrium, those things are the same temperature and they have the same average kinetic energy. But absolutely, there can be fluctuations from time to time and nothing's perfect, right? So we're just talking about like kind of the most ideal kind of sense of the thermal equilibrium. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, temperatures are the same. How about internal energies? I said, how about internal energies? Are those the same? And keep in mind, they're talking about total internal energy here. So that's true, you can't create or destroy energy and then the heat flow, right, the amount of energy released by one should be the amount of energy absorbed by another. However, if we're talking about internal energy, remember what internal energy is, that's this delta U here, and that's, if we're talking about total internal energy, three halves N kBT, right? So kB is a constant, three halves is a constant, and the temperature based on thermal equilibrium should be the same, right? But what do we not know? Exactly, right? So they said they have different gases as well, right? So we're not sure exactly how many molecules there are or how many moles of or moles of the gas there are. So in that case, we can't quite say that the internal energy is the same, um, the total internal energy that is. However, for the average internal energy, three halves kBT, just that, that's only based on the temperature alone. So we can say that the average is the same. The average internal energy is the same, but the total will be different. Right, because we don't know the number of molecules there are. But yeah, does that make sense so far? So good on you guys that um, realize that we don't know the number of molecules in that way. We can't necessarily um, figure out that total internal energy. Big N is molecules. N A is Avogadro's number. Little N is moles. Yep. Uh, oops, I forgot the last part. So are the average speeds of the molecules the same? Well, let me actually kind of skip forward here so you guys can see like the more detailed explanations for this stuff because I want to make sure you guys have access to that as well.
Yep, they wouldn't be the same. Now why is that? So what, now why is that? Why wouldn't they be the same? So I see some people saying here that the masses are different. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. Absolutely. So we know for a fact that since this thing is in thermal equilibrium, right, then we should have the same temperature. If we have the same temperature, right, based on average kinetic energy is equal to 3 halves kBT, everything else is constant except temperature. And if temperature is also the same between the two, then we should see the same average kinetic energy. Well, if we want to make sure that the average kinetic energy is the same, we know that the average kinetic energy is also equal to half mv squared, right? But they specifically stated that those two containers have different kinds of gases. We're assuming they also have different kinds of masses as well, right? Well, if I have one that's 6 kilograms and the other one is 20 kilograms, right? Let's just say that. Then in order for them to have the same average kinetic energy, their velocities have to be different, right? Their velocities have to be different. In that case, like Eric said, if you have a heavier molecule, it'll tend to move a little bit slower. If you have a lighter molecule, um, it'll tend to be faster, right? So two molecules could very well have the same average kinetic energy. But in that case, you might have a very heavy gas molecule traveling really slowly or a very light gas traveling very fast. So we can't be sure exactly about the um, the average speeds there either, right? So that's this is really important. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yep, pretty much. Yes. Yeah. So we don't know the masses of the gas, or how many molecules there are. Yeah, so for for number two where we're determining the internal energies. Remember the total internal energy is dependent on the number of molecules and the temperature. Well, we know the temperature is the same, but we don't know how many molecules are in each container. For part three, where we're talking about the average speeds, well, we know the average kinetic energy is the same, and we're trying to figure out the speed, but the average kinetic energy is not just dependent on the speed, it's also dependent on the mass. And since they're different kinds of gases, well, we don't know what each mass is. You know, so. Yeah, missing information for those last two. That's why we can't necessarily figure them out. Make sense so far? Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, and this is just another example to how to calculate um, average speed and stuff. So I will skip that over for a sec here and make sure I just get enough time to, to cover everything else. But what if we have more than one type of gas in a specific container? So the last problem was talking about two different containers, two different gases, but what if we have more than one type of gas in one container, right? Now, average kinetic energy will actually stay the same, right? Regardless of, you know, if you have nitrogen, helium, whatever in your container, the average kinetic energy of everything will still remain the same. Because remember, the average kinetic energy, the 3 halves kBT, that's dependent on the temperature there, right? It's only dependent on the temperature. So if you have a container filled with helium, hydrogen, nitrogen, whatever, all the gas molecules will have the same average kinetic energy, assuming that they're all at the same temperature, right? So they'll have the same average kinetic energy, assuming that they're at the same temperature. Now, some of them might be traveling faster. Some of them might be traveling slower. It just depends, right, on the mass. If you have something that's heavier, it's going to travel slower. If you have something that's lighter, it's going to travel faster. But the idea is like if you do it from an arithmetic kind of um, perspective, right? So if you just kind of look at things, very simple math, right? So if, we, if we said m was a value of 2 and v was a value, v squared was a value of 4, right? Then half times 2 times 4, that just gives us 4, right? So this is a really light molecule with a very fast speed, for example, right? So I want to get a value 
of average kinetic energy of four, right? Well, if I have four then is equal to half, well, what if I had a really heavy molecule? Let's say it's 20 now, right? Now I want to figure out what my V squared value is. Well, what I can do, 20 divided by two there is 10, right? Divide over the 10, and I get like 0.4 on the left, and that's equal to V squared. You take the square root of that, right? You'll see that your V is a lot smaller than what you had before, right? So really heavy molecules will travel slower, really light molecules will travel faster. But the idea is that if they're at the same temperature, we want to make sure that they have the same average kinetic energy, right? So, yeah, doesn't mean that they're all traveling at the same speed, but it's kind of a recap of what I said. Um, you also have to learn how to calculate partial pressure for this chapter. You've probably done this a million times for, for Gen Chem as well, but figured I'd recap that too. So there's two ways you can calculate partial pressure. I'm not sure which way they would require you to do it, but here are both ways. So you can either have partial pressure being calculated by multiplying the mole fraction times the total pressure if that's given to you, right? Um, so XA is zero mole fraction, which is basically just taking the moles of the gas that you're interested in and then dividing it by the total moles of gas. So if I have six moles of gas, and then two of them are oxygen. So two out of six would be my mole fraction of oxygen multiplied by one atmosphere, for example. And then that would give me the partial pressure of oxygen. And then for each partial pressure, if I have oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, whatever, right, I can add up each partial pressure using Dal Dalton's law of partial pressures. And that gives me the total temperature, right? So that, that's not too bad. You could also use the equation below, which is strictly what they have in the reading. So I'm assuming this probably might be the more popular method to do it. Um, but the idea here is that we're using this equation here, if you remember that, PV equals NKBT, right? Um, we can divide over the V, the volume, and we can see that N divided by the volume, that's molecules divided by liters, basically, right? Kind of similar to moles per liter. So essentially we can kind of, you know, distill this little term here into concentration, more or less. Concentration times KBT, right? You can kind of think about this as almost like moles per liter, your concentration times KBT, and that's equal to your pressure. So for each gas that you want to calculate a partial pressure for, you just take the concentration of that gas, moles per liter, for example, right? Times KBT, and that gives you the partial pressure for each gas. So remember, C in the equation is the concentration that you're of the gas that you're trying to find a partial pressure for. N divided by V is basically the concentration as it's the number of molecules per volume unit, kind of similar to moles per liter, like I said. So if you take that concentration times KBT for each one, like let's say this is oxygen, this is hydrogen, this is nitrogen, whatever, you take the C times KBT for each one, you take the concentration of each gas times KBT, add up every single pressure, and then that gives you your total pressure. So that is all with respect to the um, relationship between temperature, pressure, and kinetic energy. Now, we're going to move on to first law of thermodynamics stuff, right? First law of thermodynamics. So to really kind of help um, understand some things here, I wanted to kind of give some background stuff about um, and, and reminders about what we did in 131 too. So if you remember, how do we define change in macroscopic energy in 131, right? So for macroscopic energy, macroscopic meaning things on a larger scale. So, you know, you're looking at small things through a microscope. We're looking at big things through a macroscope, basically. Think about it that way, right? So energy transfer in a macroscopic sense, let's say that would be, um, I think, yeah, let me just use the example that they use in the book because I think this one is actually really good. I, I don't have it written here, but... Um, yeah, this one is, is really good. So if you were to have a jar, right, that you filled up with um, some beads or, or some jelly beans or whatever, right? If you were to slide that jar along a table, that whole jar with the jelly bean inside it will move, right? On a macroscopic sense, looking at large scale things in the larger sense, the grand scheme of things, right? That jar as a whole slid across the table we can look at the kinetic energy that the jar had. We can look at the um, internal energy that the, or the potential energy, I mean, that the uh, 
jar had, all of that stuff from a macro sense, right? But that's not necessarily all the total internal energy that we have, right? It's not just macroscopic forms of energy, right? We also have microscopic forms of energy. So if the you know if we're looking at the you know let's say the glucose molecules and and some jelly beans, right? We're looking at the bonds between them. Those will have potential energy. Um, maybe the, the you know jelly beans might not not be actually moving necessarily in the jar, but you know in general the idea is that you'll have also kinetic and potential forms of microscopic energy. Now, this is the equation that we used in 131. This was the um, the work energy theorem, right? So we said that work externally to the system is equal to the change in the energy of the system. And then that's also equal to the sum of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. The only types of energies that we focused on in 131 were the macroscopic energy forms. So when we were calculating stuff like work, we're looking at the force times the displacement. We're looking at, you know, the force that you exerted on the jar to cause it to slide a certain displacement of like four meters, for example, or whatever, right? Um, that's the macroscopic sense that we looked at in 131. In 132, we're looking at the microscopic sense, right? We're looking at microscopic kinetic energy and microscopic potential energy. The idea here is that the net external force, or net external work, I mean, that gives us that total change in energy is not just actually equal to kinetic energy on the macro sense and potential energy on the macro sense. It's also equal to microscopic kinetic energy, or it's also equal to the sum of the microscopic kinetic energy and microscopic potential energy. So basically what you see here is another delta K micro plus another delta U, but micro as well. And that's giving us our net external work. So our net external work is then equal to the work that's done macroscopically and the work that's done microscopically. The way I can kind of model this, if I had that jar and I was just kind of shaking it up and down, I'm shaking not only the jar on a macroscopic sense, but I'm also shaking the, the jelly beans inside it on a microscopic sense. So if we were thinking about the jelly beans as the molecules that make up the jar, right, or the molecules that are inside um, a specific, you know, substance, then they're also moving in there too, right? So I'm not only just moving or shaking the jar itself, but I'm also shaking the jelly beans inside. So I'm shaking the macroscopic sense, and I'm shaking the microscopic sense too. Right? And that's the net work that I'm doing overall. I'm not only exerting work externally to the jar itself, but I'm also imparting some work on the microscopic you know, forms of energy there too. But, um, yeah, and I kind of went over this example over here as well. But for 132, we're forgetting all the macroscopic stuff and we're only focusing on microscopic changes. But if we're looking at stuff like gases, right, where we have you know, two, three moles of gases, even if you just have one mole, that's six times 10 to the 23rd molecules right there. Like I was talking about earlier, where we have to keep track of like six pieces of information, the position and the velocity in X, Y, Z and directions respectively for each one, right? That's just a lot of information to kind of keep track of for the microscopic changes in kinetic energy and, and, uh, and potential energy. So there has to be a better way that we can keep track of it, right? We want to take up all these microscopic changes and then substitute them with a single value or a concept that kind of sums everything up for us, right? And that specific concept that we can look at is heat, Q, which is the flow of microscopic energy due to collisions between molecules. So Q is your W microscopic, right? Q is going to be defined as that energy flow of microscopic energy due to collisions between molecules. We can define that as our microscopic work. Instead of taking every single molecule, looking at its kinetic energy, looking at its potential energy, all of that, right? You can just kind of sum everything up. The net microscopic work is the heat, which is the energy flow due to collisions between molecules. And remember, heat is also flow of the energy from higher temp objects to low temp objects when they're in thermal contact, and that happens spontaneously. Um, <clears throat> Now we want to also ask ourselves, right, well, if we're trying to get to that first law of thermodynamics, right, where, which is that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be transferred, right? If we want to think about that and get to some kind of mathematical proof of that, right, we have to ask ourselves, how does heat um, and microscopic work then contribute to the work energy theorem, right? 
So we define Q as the microscopic energy flow, the microscopic work, right, due to collisions between molecules. Now we can rearrange some previous equations to kind of get that relationship that I was talking about, right? So if we remember that first equation, it said that the overall net external work was equal to the macroscopic work plus the microscopic work, right? Well, we also know that the net external work was equal to our total, our change in total internal energy, right? And then we know that we define that Q, that heat flow, as the, um, the energy flow due to collisions between molecules. That was our microscopic work. Well, now you can see here, this is our microscopic work, that Q, right? We can substitute that in. And we know that the net external work is equal to E total, right? So then we can say that our W net microscopic, right? Our net mi mac or microscopic, sorry, our net macroscopic work, work done on the large scale, plus Q, which is our microscopic work, is equal to the total change in energy or our total change in thermal energy or internal energy, right? So our macroscopic work plus our microscopic work which we defined as heat, are equal to our overall net, uh, next, uh, net external work, which is then equal to the change in internal energy. Instead of saying E total, we just now define it as delta U, which is the change in total internal energy. So we're getting closer there, right? We want to define this W now as the macroscopic work, right? And this is the microscopic work, and then that equals our total change in our... Um, internal energy. And that gives us our first law of thermodynamics there. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, and it can only be transferred between the system and the environment, right? Or between two different types of energy. So transferring between kinetic and potential, right? For example, which that would that might qualify as a uh, microscopic form of of work. Or we can also have transfer between the system and the environment. So maybe you're releasing heat off from the system, right? So that's the idea of the first law of thermodynamics there. And that brings us to the question, well, how can energy be exchanged? Like I mentioned that earlier, right? So we can exchange energy. We can cause a change in the energy delta U via work or heat. Work is the energy transfer on a macroscopic level there. So that might be compressing or expanding a gas, in, a, a gas container, right? So if you have like a piston, you might expand the gas, you might, you know, compress it, and then that will cause that macroscopic um, work, and that will cause a change in energy, right? And that's basically your force times displacement. That's your macroscopic, things on a, on a larger scale, right? Heat, on the other hand, is a transfer of the thermal energy from one system to another, right? And that, well, like I said, it spontaneously flows from hotter objects to colder objects until everything kind of equilibrates and temperatures of both systems are the same. So, like I said, microscopic energy flow due to collisions. And there's exchange of energy until the average kinetic energy or the temperature in both systems is the same. So you can exchange energy as either work on the macroscopic sense or heat, which is the microscopic work, right? Make sense so far? Any questions at all? Um, I will upload it um, as soon as I'm done with it. I'm sorry, I should have uploaded it maybe earlier prior to this, so I apologize, but I will have it uploaded on a Google Drive for sure. Um, but yeah, if there are any other questions about this stuff, then we can move on, because this is like the really, really, really important stuff here. I will send a link at the end of the, um, the PowerPoint stuff to the Google Drive. Yep, yep. But yeah. Um, now, what does the concept of work done by or on a system mean? This is one of the most common mistakes that students make um, when they get to the quizzes and the exams and stuff and these types of questions. Um, and I personally, like, I went through hell trying to figure out work done by slash on a system, right? It, 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 I mean, it seems pretty simple. It's not like a difficult concept, maybe. But, and maybe you've already gotten, so that, you know, props to you if you've already understood it. Um, but 
I can see where things might go wrong. Um, so hopefully I can try to make it easier to understand uh, work done by or on a system. So work done on a system is work done externally on the system by the environment, right? So if I'm thinking of, and this is the most common example, if I'm thinking of a piston, right? The piston, let's say here's the piston right there. If it's pushing there on the gas, let's say the gas molecules are here, that little piston is doing work externally on the system. It's pushing on the system. It's exerting a pressure on the system, right? Work done by a system is the work done internally by the system on the environment. So naturally, to kind of oppose that pressure that the piston is exerting on the gas, the gas itself will try to exert a force or a pressure back on the piston. And I have a picture of that here in a sec. Um, but yeah, that's work done on a system and work done by a system. Now, this is also the, you know, one of the more important pieces that a lot of people mess up on. How do we define positive and negative work, right? Positive and negative work. Well, work is positive when you have the force and the displacement vectors in the same direction, which is parallel components. Work is positive when energy is added to the system. That's what it means. Positive work means energy added to the system. Negative work is when the force and the displacement vectors are in the opposite direction. So you might be pushing this way, but the displacement is actually in this direction, right? So they have a 180 degree angle, basically. And in that case, negative work means energy is removed from the system. Really, work is the only issue that students often have heat is usually not a big problem because heat when it's positive yeah positive heat kind of makes sense right positive heat means energy is added to the system negative heat energy is removed from the system positive heat means that f heat is flowing into a system from a hotter object negative heat means that heat is flowing out of the system into a cooler object so positive heat means that there's a colder object now absorbing that energy that thermal energy right and increasing that energy to the system, heat flowing out, then you have energy being removed from the system. That's the idea there. Um, someone asked me earlier as well, like how do I figure out if work done by or on a system is negative or positive with respect to the gas, like PV work stuff, all of that, right? Now, Here are the pistons that I was talking about. Those are in the readings as well. So if you want to look at those later on, um, you can refer back to the reading too. But I've summed up what they said because it's kind of hectic. But if we're looking at, first of all, forget the second piston for now. Let's look at the first piston. Or yeah, forget the second piston. Let's look at the first piston. So the first piston you can see here is what? Compression or expansion? Expansion, right? Yeah. So you're expanding the gas there. You're expanding that piston there. So first piston is expansion of a gas. Now, if we wanted to define the work done on the system, work done on the system, well, is work done on the system positive or negative in this case? Well, remember, positive work means that energy energy's added to the system, and the force and the displacement are in the same direction. Negative work means energy is removed from the system and the force and the displacement are in the opposite direction, anti-parallel. So let's kind of analyze things first. Like I said, work done on a system is the work that is trying to be done by the environment on our system. It's the work that's being done by the piston on the gas. Based on the previous table, we said that work is negative if force and displacement are in different directions, anti-parallel. So if we look at things here, right? Let's look at the work done on the system, the, the force or the work done by the environment on the gas, right? It's the force or the work exerted by the environment on the system, on the gas, right? So if the environment, right, if the environment force is to the left, right, so the piston 
is naturally trying to compress or put pressure on the gas to the left, then, and the container expands to the right, you have a negative force then, force of the environment on the gas. Think about this maybe too as um, um, the, the atmosphere's pressure, right? So the atmosphere is always gonna be trying to push downwards, or in this case, leftwards on the gas, right? So the environment, the atmosphere, that little pist piston there, right, is naturally gonna try to kind of compress that gas. It's naturally wanting to put extra pressure on the gas to the left, it's exerting that force to the left. But the container expands to the right. So we have a positive displacement there. Well, the force is to the left and the displacement is to the right. Then what is the value of work here? Is it positive or negative? Negative, right? So if F is negative, delta X is positive. So for this expansion, right, you have an increase in volume there moving to the right. The container, let's say this is our zero point. If you're expanding, there's a positive displacement, but then the force of the environment, the force of the atmosphere, kind of pushing naturally to the left, trying to exert pressure there on the gases. And then that's going to be the opposite direction. So work done on the system in this case is negative. And I'll get to the compressing part here in a second. But if we want to look at work done by the system, and yes, this, would, this example is going to apply to figuring out signs for PV diagrams. I'm going to get to like that here and like this part right here. So I'll explain that here in a sec. But work done by a system on the environment will be a little bit different, right? So we said work is positive if the force and displacement are in the same direction. They're parallel, right? Well, in this case, the, like we said, the force of the gas, the gas is always trying to push up against the piston. So it's trying to push to the right. But the gas is being compressed. So the piston is moving is moving to the left, right? So you have a negative displacement while the force of the gas on the environment, the force of the system on the environment, the work done by the system on the environment is to the right. So you have a positive force while you have a negative displacement, right? Or did I mess it up? Hold up. Oh, my bad. Yeah, I, I drew the force incorrectly. My bad. I was looking at the... Um... Wait, hold up. Yeah, I think, oh shoot, I think I might have written these incorrectly. So if you have, a compression, you should have a positive work. That's for sure. I know that for a fact. I'm just trying to see where I messed up here. Expansion is going to be negative work. Compression is positive. It's just that I'm not sure what I messed up here for the force. Oh, shoot. Okay, never mind, never mind, never mind. I, I, I see what I was doing wrong. So, I apologize. Um, what I'm saying is right. It's just that for some reason, I started looking at the second piston. That's where 
I, I got confused. I, it should be, we're just looking at the first piston for now. I'm defining work done on a system and work done by a system looking at the first pistons. That's, that's where I went wrong. That was, that was my mistake. I was looking at the second piston. I was really confused. No, this, what's written here is absolutely right because this is a positive displacement, right? The piston is still moving to the right. Piston is moving to the right. And then the force of the gas, the gas is naturally trying to push up against that piston, right? And so the force of the gas on the system, or the force of the gas on the environment, right? So the work done by the system on the environment is to the right, and the piston is also moving to the right. So they're the same direction, and that's why work is positive. Okay, let me read some of the things in the chat here because I, I, I know I might have confused you guys there for a sec. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll get to the, the whole, like, because it, it, you can easily figure it out just by looking at the W is equal to negative P delta V equation, but I'll get to that in a second. But once again, just to kind of recap, work done on the system, right? What's done on the system by the environment, the environment acting on the system, right? So environment on the gas. The atmospheric pressure is going to tend to kind of want to press press this gas inwards, right? That piston is going to tend to want to press that gas inwards. So the force is to the left. The force of the environment on the gas, the force of the environment on the system, the work done by the environment on the system, work done on the system, right? So the force is to the left, but our distance, our displacement here, right, is to the right because the piston is actually going to the right and the overall gas container is expanding. So this is expansion. In expansion, we have a positive displacement, an increase in volume, right? But the natural direction of the force of the environment on the gas, the atmospheric pressure will tend to want to press inwards on the gas to the left. That's the environment acting on the gas, the environment acting on the system, work done on the system by the environment, right? But in an expansion, we have that positive displacement there because the volume is getting bigger. So you have 180 degree angle, they're in the opposite directions. So your work done on the system by that environment should be negative. The force of the environment on the system is negative while you're expanding the container giving it a positive X or a increase in volume. And so those two will be different directions. And so you'll have negative work there. Once again, looking at that, just that first piston, that, that concept of expansion there, right? Well, if I'm expanding the gas, if I'm exp or if I'm expanding the container and I'm expanding the, um, the volume there, it's a positive displacement. But now I'm looking at the work done by the system. What does the system kind of exert on that piston as it's expanding? Well, the system, the gases, will naturally want to press up against that piston, right? To kind of escape the container. And so force of the gas, force of the system on the environment, that's the work done by the gas, by the system on the environment, that is in the positive direction. And your expansion is also in the positive direction because you're increasing the volume there. And so since they're in the same direction, work done by the system in this case is positive. Does that make sense so far? Okay, any questions at all? Don't don't be shy to, to to let me know if you guys aren't understanding this stuff. Because then I, I you saw me get confused myself right then and there. But the idea is that we're looking at work done on the system and by the system for each piston alone. Yeah, definitely more practice problems are going to help. But if we look at that, the second piston, the second piston. If we're compressing it, 
we're pushing the piston to the left. So we're giving it a negative displacement. Well, let's look at the work done on the system. What does the environment do on the system? Well, the environment is always going to try to press down in, inwards, right? It's always going to try to exert more pressure on the gas. It's always going to try to flatten out the gas, right? That's the force of the environment on the gas. Well, if we're interested in looking at the work done by the environment, done by environment on the gas or on the system, right? Then we're looking at the force done by the environment on the system. And we're looking at the displacement that occurs. Right? So for compressing the container, we're giving it a negative displacement there, a decrease in volume. They happen to be in the same direction. So in this case, work is actually positive on the system. Because the force on the system by the environment is to the left. And we're also compressing the container to the left. Left, left, gives you positive work. In this case, you also get positive work, but it's work done by the system. This is work done on the system that's positive. Work done by the system that's positive. But the idea here is that this was compression and this was expansion. Really? What you can do is just understand one of them and then flip the signs for the other. So if I know that in an expansion, in expansion, work done on the system is negative and work done by the system is positive, then for a compression, I just reverse the values. For a compression, work done on the system is positive. This would actually be positive for a compression. And then for compression, work done by the system is negative. So you just kind of flip the signs there as well, if you want to think about it that way. But if we're looking at piston two, once again, if the natural force of the environment on the gas on the system is to the left, and you're also compressing it, you're decreasing the volume to the left, then those are in the same direction. And so the work done by the environment, by the atmosphere on the system of gases is going to be positive. Once again, if we're compressing a gas too, right? for decreasing that volume, having a negative displacement. But now we're interested in looking at the work done by the system, by the gases back on the piston itself. Well, the gas is going to want to press up against the piston to try and escape and prevent the extra pressure on it, basically. So the force is going to be to the right, positive, while you're compressing it to the left, causing a decrease in volume, negative, right? So opposite directions, that gives you a negative work done by the system. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Any questions about this stuff right here? Nope. Um, yeah, this is another example that, yeah, it's, we're running a little low on time, so I'll skip this one as well, but this, like I said, it's also found in the reading. It's not too bad. Finally, we're going to get to PV work. PV work is more or less just a bunch of equations that you have to memorize, or, well, not memorize, yeah, you have equation sheets, so, sorry, sorry, but, um, yeah, so just, just, for, for this, really, it's mo mostly knowing the equations. The only thing that I would add is that for PV work, right, um, and I'll get to this in a second, but I'll just kind of save this earlier. This work that you're looking at, think about this as the work done on the system. It's best to think about it as the work on the system in order for all the science to make sense. So PV work is work due to changing the volume of the system at a constant pressure, right? At least for this equation. Um, like I said, this equation can only be used when your pressure is constant. This W is equal to negative P delta V can only be used if the pressure is constant and the only thing that's changing is your volume. Yeah, so think about this work as work done on the system. 
work done on the system. Don't think about it as by the system. Work done on the system. So if, for example, you were using it, and then they asked you what's the work done by the system, like I said, what you can do is just basically flip the sign. So if I have positive work done on the system, then I have negative work done by the system. You can think about it as Newton's third law, action reaction pair. Whatever work is done on the system is the same but opposite direction as the work done by the system. But yeah, definitely work, look at the work here as the work done on the system. That's how all the signs make sense. Because if you look at it, if I have if I'm compressing something, am I increasing or decreasing volume? Let's just let me just ask that. Decreasing, right? So if I'm if I'm compressing, I'm decreasing the volume. So I should have a negative or a positive value value here for delta v. Negative. So negative and negative gives me a positive work. Well, like I said, this is work done on the system. And I compressed. I compressed. So if I'm compressing, I'm decreasing the volume, giving delta V a negative value, giving work on the system positive. So if I go back up here and I look at, okay, well, the second piston was an example of compression. This was an example of compression. And I was looking at work done on the system, right? So if I'm assuming that W equals negative P delta V, this work is done on the system. Well, if I'm compressing to where my volume is decreasing to where delta V is negative, and W is positive, then work done on the system should be positive, which you can see right here. And then that would mean that work done by the system is negative. Like I said, you just flip the sign. So if they're asking you for the work done by the system on a for in a compression, you would use that equation. This gives you the work done on the system. And then you just flip the sign to get the work done by the system. That's it. If I said expansion, expansion is what? Increasing or decreasing volume? Increasing, right? So delta V should be positive, and therefore your work done on the system should be negative. So if work done on the system is negative, in an expansion, let's check that. So we said expansion right here of a gas. We're looking at work done on the system. Remember we said on the system, so this is the environment. The environment, the atmosphere is trying to push inwards to compress the gas while you're changing the volume to increase it to the right. So a positive delta x with the environment doing work on the system to the left, the atmosphere pushing on the system to the left, on the gases to the left. Then you have opposite direction, 180 degree angle. That gives you negative work. And that checks out, right? Because w equals negative p delta v. If you're expanding, delta v is positive negative p right there so work is negative so work done on the system is negative in an expansion work done by the system is positive in an expansion so this is work done on the system by the environment work done by the system on the environment work done on the system by the environment work done by the system on the environment Yeah, but that's the most important thing is to think about the work for any of these, you know, equations here in the in a sec. Those are all going to be work on the system. And so if you want to figure out the work by the system, you just have to flip the sign. Um, oh yeah, this is kind of a repeat of what I said. So if the gas is compressed, volume is decreased, delta V is negative, work is work done on the system is positive. The answer you get will be work for done on the system. And then to get the value for work done by the system in a compression, you just give it the opposite sign. So work done by the system in a compression is negative. Work done on the system in a compression is positive. This is Newton's third law, basically. Every action, equal but opposite reaction here. If gas is expanded, volume is increased, so delta V is positive. Work is negative, done on the system. If we want to figure out by the system, just flip the sign, so it's positive. And the same deal here. Another example problem. Um, you can kind of refer to that in the reading as well. But PV diagrams, 
They label pressure on the y-axis, volume on the x-axis. They can help us calculate the work by finding the area under the graph. In those cases, the n, or the number of gas molecules, remains constant in these processes. And then here's an, a really important concept. We know that this equation, the PV equals nKBT, n and KB are basically going to remain constants for these processes. KB is Boltzmann's constant, and we already said that n remains constant. The number of molecules of gases is going to remain the same. So if n is constant, KB is constant, PV is just dependent on temperature. PV is directly proportional to temperature. So if pressure and volume are super high, then you have a high temperature. If pressure and volume are super low, then you have a low temperature. It's really important to understand as well. Alternatively, right, let's say if you kept your volume the same and you increased your, temp or you increased your pressure, right, would you see an increase or decrease in temperature? I myself zoned out one sec, so let me let me restate the question real quick because I, I don't even remember what I asked honestly. Um, so if I have PV and I know that's proportional to that's not a proportional sign um, to temperature, right? If I kept V the same and I just increased my pressure, should I see an increase or decrease in temperature? That's what I was asking. I think yeah. would actually be increasing the temperature, right? Because if that volume is kept the same and I just increase the pressure, then I have to increase the temperature if they're related, right? So the idea here is that if you have like PV, let's say those are three times four, right? And that gives you a temperature equal to 12. Well, if I kept the four the same and I upped the pressure to six, well, six times four is 24 now. So my temperature had to increase. So that's the idea there for the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature. You can also say, if I kept the pressure the same <clears throat> and I increase the volume, then I see an increase in temperature. If I decrease the volume, I see a decrease in temperature. That's the idea there. Um, but... Now we can look at how to calculate work for isobaric processes. So we said that isobaric processes are done at constant pressure, right? That just means isobaric just means constant pressure, and so your graph is generally going to be a horizontal line. So for these types of processes, we can just use the equation W equals negative P delta V because your pressure is constant, and your only thing is changing that is um, your your volume, right? Delta V is your VF minus VI, so final volume minus initial volume. Like I said, it'll be negative for compressions because you're, you know, causing a decrease in the volume. <coughs> um, and your delta V will be positive for expansions because you get larger in volume. So for compressions, if delta V is negative, W is positive for compressions and W is negative for expansions based on the equation. You can just simply literally just figure out the area underneath the curve for isobaric processes. For isochoric processes, Isochoric just means volume is constant. So volume is constant. If volume doesn't change, then it's just a vertical line. And we assume that um, the pressure then will obviously increase, right? So volume doesn't change, pressure will. In these cases, really simple, work is zero. Because you really don't have a curve to find an area underneath, right? So there's not much. That you literally can't find the area under this curve because there's no curve, essentially. So the work is zero here for an isochoric process. Now, there's isochoric heating and isochoric cooling. Heating, right, is when we have a um, increase in pressure at that same volume. Because remember, we said that PV is proportional to temperature, right? So the volume stays the same. If I increase the pressure, I increase the temperature. So increasing in pressure will increase in temperature. And so we call that isochoric heating. If you see an increase in pressure at the same volume, that's isochoric heating. Because at that same volume, if you're increasing the pressure, 
because of this relationship, you're going to increase the temperature as well. Isochoric cooling, opposite deal, right? So if I decrease the pressure when the volume is the same, so instead of going upwards, I go downwards, then I'm decreasing the pressure while the volume is the same, so my temperature will have to decrease as well. So you're cooling versus heating. And like I said, work is zero for these because there's no area to find under the curve, basically. Um, isothermal processes now. Isothermal means temperature is constant. So if we go back to that initial equation, PV equals NKBT, well, all of a sudden now, N, KB, and T are constants. So um, the video will be uploaded on, on YouTube, by the way. Um, I'll, I will send you my, the YouTube channel link, but it should be in the announcements section for 132 as well. <clears throat> but um, essentially what you see here is that you have a bunch of constant values equal to PV. And so we can rearrange that equation to be PV is equal to constant, and then we can divide over the V. So we get constant values that NKB T divided by V, because those will all be constant now. Temperature is constant, number of molecules is constant, Boltzmann is constant, right? So what we see here is this relationship here for an isothermal process. P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2, right? And then to find out the work for an isothermal process, we use this equation here. Long-winded, seems very complex. You'll have the equation sheet, so it'll just plug and chug from here. Um, for an expansion, right, your V2, your second volume will obviously be greater, or your VF would be greater, right? Then your V1 or VI. So then if this was like four divided by two, then natural log would be positive and your overall work would be negative because you have that negative sign there at the beginning. For a compression, on the other hand, your second volume is getting smaller. So in that case, you might have like two over four. So in that case, natural log would be like a decimal and the natural log between numbers zero and one will be negative. And so if this natural log is negative and you have this extra negative sign, then you can say for a compression, that natural log portion would be negative and then the overall work would be positive for a compression. And then once again, this is work done on the system, right? If we can, we can confirm that. We said for an expansion, work done on the system is negative. So I go back up here for an expansion. Here's expansion, work done on the system, negative right and that checks out for expansion work done on the system is negative you can see the same thing for compression as well this is what an isothermal graph looks like kind of curved and it makes sense right because there's an inverse relationship between pressure and volume now as pressure increases this way right your volume will decrease as, pre as pressure decreases this way, your volume will increase. So it's an inverse relationship there. Finally, though, we have adiabatic processes. These just are when no heat can flow to or from a system. So Q is equal to zero. And that's when your work is equal to your delta U. Because W plus Q is equal to delta U. And if Q is zero, then W is equal to delta U. Right? The PV diagram for an adiabatic process is very similar to isothermal process, but it's slightly steeper. So it might look like, um, what is it? Kind of like this, almost. Maybe, something like that, you know? And usually the work done underneath an isothermal graph is usually greater. Because the area underneath is going to be greater. But the equation for a PV, or not PV, for an adiabatic, adiabatic process, my bad, um, to find out the relationship between pressures and volumes is this really convoluted, weird kind of equation. This five thirds, there's like a really long derivation as to how to get it. It's insane. It's not necessary to understand. You just really have to know this. It seems unnecessary. I even said it seems unnecessary. Um, I don't remember if it appears on the equation sheet, but I definitely, like I, th I said, I think I remember now, but I definitely just saw an old quiz that, um, 
needed this information right here to solve it. Because I think like they gave you the first initial pressure and the fire and the, the initial pressure and the initial volume, and then they gave you the final pressure, but they didn't give you the final volume. And so you need this relationship to figure out the final volume, basically. It's on the equation sheet. Okay, excellent. But then um, a mistake that they made, actually, for last semester, I don't know if they fixed it for this semester or not, and it, it's also a mistake still in the readings, is that um, your work for an adiabatic process is not positive 3 halves, PFVF minus P, PIVI. It's negative 3 halves. Yeah, and only, only V is raised to the power of 5 thirds. At least I think, if I remember correctly. But yeah, I would check the equation sheet. But yeah, just, just know this relationship here. Um, how is work done underneath greater for adiabatic if the slope is supposed to be steeper than the isothermal? Um, so the idea here is that if you look at it like this, right? So usually it, it, that's essentially how they kind of they, they draw them. Um, so it, you can see here this is a much steeper slope. But it only covers this much this much area as opposed to this much area. Does that make sense? Like at least from a visual kind of perspective, I think. Um, I'm not quite sure. Like, you would have to really kind of compare the the difference between these two equations to really figure out the difference in work and why. But it can get kind of confusing. Um, I do remember like one of the quizzes before they kind of asked you to do that visually. And if you drew, like you sketched it kind of wrong, it was kind of difficult to see. But that was only like a one point part of a problem. So it's not a big deal. But um, I don't think they'll ever like ask you to directly just kind of visually determine that again. But yeah, just something to kind of keep an eye out for as well. Oh, I said isothermal has a greater amount of work. Adiabatic has less work. So... This, this is an isothermal process graph, right? The adiabatic is a little bit steeper, kind of like this, right? So this is shallower and this is steeper, right? And so the work done here is like from here to here, but the work for an isothermal process like is the entire part right here. So isothermal has more work, adiabatic has less work. Yep. Yep, for sure. Um, that's it, I think, for, for this stuff. Like I said, I think I'm fairly certain this should be a negative 3 halves, the way that they're writing this. Um, negative 3 halves, PF, VF, minus PI, VI. Anyone want to confirm that? I saw that back in the reading, and I was like, I don't think this is right. No one? All right. I'll go back and check on it my, myself a little, a little bit later on. But, oh, okay, cool. Um, otherwise, like I said, go to the book for additional practice problems as well. I'm not even going to, like, suggest this. <laughs> this is an order. <laughs> like, please, please, please go back to the book, to the uh, readings for additional practice problems because they are so immensely crucial. Like, I don't even remember the professors like ever talking about um, this relationship in class. Uh, maybe I was just asleep. I don't know. Maybe I just I was asleep. I was not focused. Whatever. But there are some things that like I think are just a little bit better explained. And that I'm not blaming anyone. It might just be because like everything's rushed now and all of that, and you only have so much time during lecture. But the idea here is that those readings. If they're not just going to help you cover like some additional information and get some clarity on some things, they also offer some really, really, really good practice problems. Like there are practice problems in there that have allowed me to solve entire problems on quizzes and exams that I wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Is it positive on the formula sheet? Oh, shoot. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to get back to you guys on this one. Because I strongly think it's negative. Like, I don't think I would have... Like, I was on my stuff. Like, I was very diligent about, like, making sure that it's correct. Like, all my notes and stuff are correct for 132, especially even more than 131. But 
I will get back to you on this one, but I'm fairly certain this, this should be negative. Like, I swear I was getting the wrong answer when I did it positive for, like, all the problems and stuff. But I will get back to you on that one. Um, oh, they have it positive. Okay. Let me real quick. Let me go back and check something. So... Yeah, I even added like a little negative sign to it when I was studying, so I'm not sure. Maybe I was on something else. But let me see here. So problem seven, if I go back down to problem seven. Yeah, well, I don't know. Let me check something real quick. Give me one second here. So this example here is talking about it being expanded. So they said that there was an adiabatic expansion. So if we're assuming expansion, right, then work done on the system, let me go back up here, I can double check. If we have an expansion, work done on the system is negative. Okay and work done by a system is positive. Okay, maybe I was on something else, I don't know. So I will move that negative sign then and just go with that. Yeah, maybe I was just, I don't know why I put a negative sign there, but who knows? Yeah, maybe yeah, I think it should, it should be negative, or positive, my bad. Anyway, that's whatever. Um, where's the, yep, there's good notes. Okay, so I will edit this, remove the little negative sign, and then upload that to uh, the, um, the Google Drive, and I will share that on the announcements page. I will now leave it kind of open for any questions, like real quick, and then we'll get, we'll, we'll get to the um, quiz problems here that I have for you guys. But... How are you liking the format so far? Like, is it kind of easier to follow or what's going on? Feel free to like unmute as well. So it's a little faster for you guys to communicate. Okay, so I'm, I'm seeing that it's really helpful. It damn well be helpful because I spent a lot of time on this. <laughs> no, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that it's um, easier to follow and everything. And that's awesome, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that the um, images are are easier to kind of um, look at and everything. And I think just having like everything bolded and everything as well is is kind of nice too, just to kind of show you guys the, the important equations, important concepts, and stuff. Because if you can like look at a slide and be like, okay, calculate work by finding area under the PV graph. Cool. All right. You know, you just kind of like really quickly go through and look at the um, important information, which is nice. And hopefully, I mean, we got this, we got through this decently quick, like compared to my 131 sessions, maybe, I don't know, I, I don't remember, but it's not too bad. Um, 
but yeah. yeah I'm not gonna talk about the uh, the MCAT studying at the moment. I'm I'm done. I I've finished and all that, so I'm everything's going back to normal now. But I just don't want to talk about it, honestly. Um. But yeah, we have solid twenty minutes um, that I can kind of go to the um, quiz. Real quick. But yeah. Uh, any other questions before we start? Will there be a blank PDF provided for practice quizzes? So I don't have any blank PDFs, unfortunately. But what I can do is I'll probably just go ahead and like um, wipe them out on my iPad and then just upload some blank sheets. But yeah, I'll probably do that. And, and that, that's what I that's what I did here, honestly. Like if you go ahead and erase, oops, if you go ahead and erase this, like you can see my answers and stuff. So, but. Full disclosure, <laughs> I did horrible on this quiz. Um, and I don't have the answer key for it either, unfortunately. So, like, I'm I'm not winging it because I know what I'm doing now. But it's always nice to kind of make sure that you're checking with an answer key. But, you know, it is what it is. But, yeah. Um, I'm probably going to go ahead and start. If you guys have any other questions, just pop them in the chat and I'll take a look at them in a sec. But for number one here, we had work and heat in a sealed container and ideal gas is taken from state A to state C. Oh, that's huge. State A to state C. So it goes A to B and then B to C in a two-step process, right? So A, B, B, C as depicted in the diagram. It says rank the temperatures TA, TB, and TC um, of each state. If any two are equal states, wait, if any two are equal, state so. Explain your answer. So anybody have any uh, ideas of how, we, of how we can solve this here real quick? Yep, for A. So let me stop you there for a sec. So this went from right to left, by the way. I just want to make sure that you realize that. So we went from VA to VC, so this way. Yeah, I just want to just want to make sure to clear that up. So yeah, so that's nice. I, I see uh, isochoric relationship for TB um, and TA. So you see no change in the volume. It's just an increase in pressure. So we can also define that as an isochoric heating, right? Um, and then for B to C, what kind of process do we see there? We said this is isochoric. Yep, isobaric right here, because the pressure is constant while there's also only a change in, in volume. Yep, so that's excellent. So you know that A is lower than B in that way. So the temperature for A should definitely be lower than B, right? Um, because if this is an isochoric heating, right, 
then we had this lower pressure here. We increase the pressure. Remember, really the key here, which is nice that you kind of noticed that from the beginning, is that we're going to use this relationship here, which is that PV is proportional to the temperature. So if we had that same volume, if we kept the same volume in that isochoric process right here, but we increase the pressure, then we should also increase the temperature. So for sure, TB has to be greater than TA. That's for sure, right? And then, well, what about TC? Yeah, I can explain that again. Uh, greater, well, greater than what? This one, yeah, this one is kind of confusing, right? Because you do have that increased pressure now. Um, so let me actually, before I do that, I'll explain the isochoric heating thing again. So we said that from that equation, PV equals NKBT, right? The gas molecules are constant, KB is constant. Um, and so everything kind of relies on the temperature, right? So if I have the volume the same, the volume doesn't change from point A to point B, right? It just goes upwards. The volume doesn't change. But the pressure does. It goes from 2 times 10 to the 5th to 4 times 10 to the 5th. So the pressure increased. Well, if the pressure increased and the volume was kept the same, the temperature should increase as well. Does that make sense? So in that case, TB is greater than TA. Now, for TC, we have to not only take into account this kind of relationship here, right? But um, wait, can you say that again? Yes, yes. So if we kept the pressure the same, which is from B to C, B to C is the pressure the same, but we decrease the volume, so there should be a decrease in temperature. So relative, so like compared to B, C should be less than B, right? Yep, so I see that. Yeah, for isobaric, TC um, should be less than B. Because if we have the same volume, or the same uh, pressure, my bad, and we decrease the volume, then we decrease the temperature. So TC should be less than TB. So we're getting close. So I see someone said, um, you know, it's a compression meeting. It's getting hotter since you're forcing the gas molecules to be closer to each other. There's less volume for them to move. And I, I, that's more of like an intuition kind of thing, and I wouldn't necessarily jump to that conclusion. I would more so look at this relationship here because if we see that, like I said, if we see that decrease in volume while we're keeping the same pressure, then um, we should see a decrease in temperature as well. But yeah, TC should be less than TB, but we haven't quite related it to TA yet. And that's where things get a little tricky. So for TA versus TC, you not only have a change in volume, but you also have a change in pressure, right? So um, unfortunately, we don't know the, the volumes here. We don't have like values here or anything. There was like little like graph like square things, right? On the um, actual sheet that we got. And obviously you can't really see them here. But essentially, I'll give you another piece of information here. And this is crucial to figuring things out. VA was twice the volume of VC. So VA was twice the volume of VC. And then you can also see that PA is 
is equal to half the volume of PC, right? So PC right here is 4 times 10 to the 5th. PA is 2 times 10 to the 5th. So PA is half PC, and VA is twice of VC. So this might have been like 6 liters, and this might have been 12 liters or something like that. Yeah, you're right. So they didn't they didn't necessarily state it, right? But um, the issue with like this because this is a scan, right? And so they had like little graph like paper basically, um, little boxes, and you can count the squares. And so if you counted the squares, you realize that VA was twice the value of VC. So that's like the additional piece of information that you you needed for for the problem. Um, and then. If you think about it, right, now if we're looking at temperature once again, if we're looking at PV is proportional to temperature, well, if PA is equal to half PC, right, so PA, VA is equal to TA, right? Well, PA is equal to half PC. So if we said half PC, And then VA is 2VC. And that gives you TC. Right? And so, well, actually, I take it back. So, I want to, I want to, what I want to get to here is that, like, basically the temperatures for A and C should be the same. I'm just trying to like look at a way how to kind of equate them to each other. But what you can see here is that when we doubled the pressure from A from A to C to cancel out that doubling in pressure, we de we decreased the volume in half. Does that make sense? And if we went from C to A, the idea is that we doubled the volume, but we halved the pressure. So I wouldn't like say like in movement like across the x-axis because that might like throw things off, but um, the idea is the change in the pressure and the volume relative to one another. So one of them doubled the pressure and the other, um, at, well, yeah, well, yeah, each one kind of canceled each other out. So for A, like I said, A, we doubled the pressure, but then we halved the volume. And so, um, oh man, I'm trying to think about like what's the best way to to put this together. Okay, well if we wanted to say VC is equal to VA over two. Oops, well there goes everything. Um, yeah, so instead of, yeah, let's say PC, VC equals TC. right and then vc is equal to va over 2 so va over 2 and then okay i see i see it now okay so if we said va over 2 is equal to vc so we can plug instead of saying vc we can say va over 2 and instead of saying pc we can say 2pa is equal to pc so instead of PC, we can say 2PA. You can see that these twos will cancel out, and you're left with PAVA is equal to TC. Well, PAVA is equal to TA. So TA is equal to TC. That's like a very runaround kind of way to do it. But um, like I said, like you double the pressure and you have the volume to kind of equate things to make sure that the temperature stays the same. Because remember, from A to B, we doubled the pressure, 
kept the volume the same. And that caused, a, if you doubled the pressure, kept in, keeping the volume the same, you're gonna basically double the temperature. Well, how do I have that temperature again? Right? I would have to half the volume, for example. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, don't worry, but like, you can go back and kind of watch it again. Maybe it'll start to sink in a little bit more. Um, trust me, I, <laughs> I did not get this during the quiz. So um, I totally understand if it takes a minute to kind of process things for it. But that's the idea there is that we doubled the pressure here, causing a doubling in temperature based on that PV is proportional to T relationship. So we doubled the pressure while keeping the volume the same. And then if we want to bring the temperature back again, right? Because we did, if we doubled pressure, keeping the volume the same, so we have two PV, we have to multiply by two on the other side as well. Well, in order to get T back, T back again on the right, just a single T, we'd have to multiply the volume by one half. We have to half the volume. So we do one half times V. The one half will cancel out with two, and you have to multiply by one half here as well. And so, two and one half will also cancel out and you're left with PV is equal to T again. So you're back to that single T. So since you doubled the pressure but then canceled out that doubling by having the volume, then it br brought you back to your original temperature basically. And so TB is greater than TA, which is equal to TC. Make sense so far? Okay. Um, now for part B, it's saying rank the internal energies UA, UB, and UC of the gas um, on each state. If any two are equal, state so. So it's kind of similar, right? I'll kind of explain this because we're running low on time here. But for U, we know that U is equal to three halves and kVT, right? That's the total internal energy. Well, we're assuming that all the molecules are the same here. Number of molecules hasn't changed. So really, it's only dependent on temperature. So you just look at each of these temperatures here and then rank. Well, if TB is the greatest, and we're only basing things on temperature here, then UB should be the greatest as well. And then if TA and TC are equal to each other, and we're only basing things on temperature, then UA and UC should be equal to each other as well. Yep, proportional to temperature. Sound good for part B as well? Now for part C, it says determine the amount of work done on the gas during the entire process, right? Um, you can kind of break this up into two steps like they even said, right? It's a two-step process. For, so from A to B, oops, from A to B, do we see any work here? Yep, no, you're right, <laughs> you're right. Volume doesn't change, right? So if we're going by like PV work, right? W equals negative P delta V. Work is zero, because there's no area under the curve that we can calculate, basically. Make sense? Okay. And then from B to C, we said it's isobaric, right? So how do you calculate isobaric work? Yep. So W equals negative. Yep, go ahead. Yep, since you're compressing it, delta V would be negative, and then you should have positive work, and that's work done on the system, by the way. So in the end, you have this W is equal to negative, and this should be um, the pressure, right, was 4 times 10 to the fifth. So 4 times 10 to the fifth pascals. And then our change in volume, VF minus VI. Well, VF would be the VC here, which is the final state there. And your VI was VA, basically. right? So they gave us VA. They said that was 4 times 10 to the negative, what was that? Third? Yeah. Negative third there. Uh, meters cubed. So that's our initial volume at A. Well, 
at A or, or B, basically, right? Because it's the same volume here. Now at VC, I already kind of hinted this at this earlier since they had like squares on the exam and stuff. So VA ended up being, or, you know, number of squares underneath, right? Whereas, well, there we go, was twice of VC. So based on that, right, um, you would essentially just divide VA by two, and that gives you your um, final volume, which is the VC. So it should be two times 10 to the negative three here as well meters cubed, right? And so if you subtract these two, you're obviously gonna get a negative answer, negative will negative, um, will cancel out and you'll get, a, you'll get a positive. And I believe it's positive 800 joules, I wanna say. Make sense for C so far? Okay, cool. D, finally, just calculate the heat Q for this process, A to B to C, right? Well, we know that delta U is equal to Q plus W, right? Well, we're trying to figure out Q. We have some sense of the work here, right? This is the, the work done from A to C. This is the 800 joules that we're looking for. But we need to figure out Q. Well, how do we get delta U? And remember, delta U, delta just means a change, right? So we went from some initial to some final total internal energy, right? Exactly. So we went from some internal energy at A to some internal energy at C. So UC minus UA is equal to Q plus W. Now what you could do is you could do three halves NKBT C minus three halves NKBT A if you wanted to, right? And then kind of go through that motion. But what you don't realize is that you don't have the number of molecules, right? Nor do you have the temperature. At least you only have temperature for A well, actually, you do have the temperature. Yeah, it's TA and TC are the same. So you could, I guess you could do that way. Um, but yeah, but you don't have access to the um, number of molecules. So we couldn't do it that way. But what you might realize as well is that we already said that UA is equal to UC. So if UA is equal to UC, then this should be zero, right? So this is zero, and that's equal to Q plus W. Well, then Q is equal to negative W. And if W is 800, then Q is equal to negative 800. Make sense? Cool, cool. Um, so that's number one, working heat. Uh, number two, far easier here. Um, but this is this is the this is the idea that I was talking about with regard to 132 being a little bit more explanation heavy. So you're going to have problems where you're going to have to explain like your thought process and stuff. So um, for number two here, it says an ideal gas can be taken from state A to state B by two different processes labeled one and two as shown in the diagrams. For each process, is the work done on the gas positive, negative, or zero? Explain your answer. So remember, it says work done on the gas, right? And just by even calculating the work done under graph, right, you're going to calculate the work done on a system. If they were to ask work done by the gas, work done by the system, then you just flip the answer, basically. You flip the sign of the answer. But for process one, what type of process do we have here? A to B, there's a little arrow here. Is it an expansion? You said the negative part, right? But So remember, if your volume, this is zero volume. I'll say this is like 10 right here. If you're going from A to B, 
Yep, compression. So this is compression. Now what type of compression? Isobaric, right? It's isobaric compression. And yep, it's going to be positive work, right? Because this is W equals negative P delta V. If the V is decreasing, then negative P times negative delta V, right? And that gives you positive work, right? So solid. How about process two? Process two, I, do you really honestly like, you can just say, you don't have to like say isobaric or isochoric or whatever, because this is some goofy, um, <laughs> I don't know what that is. But, yeah. Generally, though, going from point A to point B, what do you have? Expansion or compression? Compression, right? So you decrease in volume. So it's definitely compression. Like I think I, I even wrote on the uh, quiz, like I wrote, like, this is a form of dot, dot, dot compression. Like I was like, well, I don't know what kind of compression this is. But yeah, this is definitely compression because you're decreasing in volume, right? Um, and then work is still positive, right? Work is still positive because if we're compressing the gas, the displacement or the volume change isn't going to be in the same direction as the pressure of the environment, right? So the pressure, like I said, if you remember the, um, the PowerPoint where you have the piston here, right? So the pressure or the force exerted by the environment on the gas is to the left and we're compressing it so we're moving it to the left and so they're the same direction and that mean that means work is positive still it's compression here because you went from a to b and you're going from a larger volume here let's say this is like 10 and this is zero you're going from a larger volume to a smaller volume compression or expansion is just referring to the um Increase or decrease in the volume. That's all it is. Yep, yep. Um, so yeah, so just form of compression, it's positive because the displacement um, is going to be in the same direction as the, the pressure of the environment or the force of the environment. Right, so. But yeah. Uh, part B, compare the value of W for each process. Is it smaller, larger, or equal for process one than for process two? So is, is basically basic is W1 greater than or equal to, greater than, less than, or equal to W2? That's basically what it's asking. So is the area underneath this curve more than this one or less than? That's what it's asking. Two is more, right? Like you not only have this part, like, like process one, but you also have this little roof over here, right? So the area underneath the curve is greater. So W2 has to be greater than W1, right? Area underneath the curve is greater. That's all. Area under curve is greater. Now for part C, it's final part here. Uh, compare the change in internal energy for each process. Is delta U1 smaller, larger, or equal than delta U2? Now, remember what delta U is, right? That's 3 halves N kVT, right? Delta U also happens to be equal to Q plus W, right? But a common mistake I made it so I'll, I'll let you guys figure that one out here
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, very tricky. Um, that's how I thought about it. So, <laughs> go ahead. Excellent, excellent. Yep. Great, great job. So, yeah, I. <laughs> this took me a minute. When I was reviewing it back in the day, I was like, I, what, this doesn't make any sense. And then I went back and I was like, all right, well, if the pressure here is the same as the pressure here, pressure there is the same as the pressure there, volume here is the same as the volume here, volume there is the volume, same volume there, right? We're ending up and starting off from the same points. So the temperature should be the same for both processes. Well, if delta U is dependent on the temperature, and we're assuming obviously the same number of molecules in the processes, then delta U for both should be the same. So delta U1 is equal to delta U2. What I what I ended up doing too is like I try to relate it to this equation, but we obviously have no information whatsoever about Q. So we can't really calculate that or you know give any in any indication about that whatsoever. Um but yeah. Because I said what I what I think I like I was alluding to at first too was like, if the work for two was greater, then delta u two should be greater. That's what I was thinking at, at first, right? But doesn't matter the amount of work that's being done because we can't really relate it because we don't know the q. What really u depends on only is the temperature value, um, and so since we're ending up and we know that PV is proportional to temperature, right? Well, if we're ending up at the same pressure and we're ending up that same volume for both processes, like B and B here are the exact same pressure and exact same volume. So they have the same temperature. And so if they have the same temperature, they should have the same delta U, basically. So, yeah, that's why delta U1 equals delta U2. Well, I wasn't expecting that to be the, like the way to go about thinking about this stuff, but um, there's some, some things that you can have to watch out for this being one of them. Full disclosure, I absolutely like, screwed up this quiz. Um, and, and I'm not being like one of those people that be like, oh, I got a B or something on the quiz. No, like I, <laughs> I got an F on this quiz. So <laughs> like just, just know that like I'm not inherently smart or I'm a genius, right? I try my best to help out and it's totally okay if you guys, you know, don't get things from the beginning with, right? If you don't understand something, like just don't get frustrated, keep trying, keep doing the work, keep doing the practice problems. But um, that should help. And hopefully these like PowerPoints are gonna be helpful for you guys to kind of get a summary of the readings. Cause let me tell you, the readings are crucial. Um, yeah, I know they're combining chapter two and three now. So I'm gonna work on the PowerPoints for, for uh, week three for the rest of the night and um, have those uploaded by tomorrow, hopefully. So that way you guys can have that before the the quiz on uh, on Tuesday. Who said my name? Um, I didn't see. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh yeah, I um. Well, yeah, the coins and stuff, the the problems or the uh, probabilities. Yeah, I don't like multiplicities. Yeah, like to be honest. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So the yeah, so I meant like the final like the point B. No, no, it's fine. Like I, I was saying, like the the initial volume, like point A and point A here, correspond to the same exact volume, and then point B and point B, yeah, yeah. When you compare them together, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. But 
yeah, I'll post this on the Google Drive. I'll post the PowerPoint on the Google Drive. And as soon as I have the uh, week three stuff done, I'll post those as well. And the recording to all of these things will be on YouTube as soon as I can. So I'm trying to get caught up. Um, I will film some recordings on the side too for the uh, homeworks as well. But yeah, um, hopefully I'll, I'll get everything done. I mean, I don't know if I can even get everything done by this weekend. Like I have a bunch of stuff to do. So um, before actually, okay, so... Before I continue talking, I will go ahead and end the recording, so it's going to be uploaded.